Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. Happy Lord's Day. Today we continue our study in the book of John, John chapter 18. But first, let's pray together. Dear Lord Jesus, we honor you. We bring glory to your name. Lord, I ask you for a special word for each person hearing, and Lord, for me as well. And Lord, I just ask that you will be glorified in all things. Lord, through your word. Now, Lord, I lift up the prayer request on people's hearts. Many have lost loved ones recently, and, and those, some are still grieving. I lift those up to you. I lift up those who are ill, those who are dealing with illness, either within their family or people they know. Lord, those that are dealing with financial issues, relationship issues. And God, you know all the individual requests. And there's people out there just, they have a burden, Lord, and you know what it is. And I lift their request up to you in the name of Jesus. Speak to us through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, John chapter 18. <clears throat> Last week, we talked about Jesus' prayer going to the garden. He had already had the Lord's Supper and shared with them all, many things that were going to come. And he shared with the Father how he had finished the work and he wanted to glorify the Father. And he prayed for the disciples. And he prayed for the for, for us and, and future believers through all of that. But one of the things he said was, not just that I've, I've completed this work, but that the hour has come. Now the hour has come. The next few chapters, we, get, we see what that means to Jesus. He's got to pay the price. So let's go ahead and start in John chapter 18. It starts in the garden, the Garden of Gethsemane. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kedron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. This was a place that Judas and all the disciples were very familiar with because Jesus would go there with them. It was a very solemn place, as you can see from the olive trees and many of that's a picture from the garden of gethsemane and when you see that it's a it's a very peaceful place a place he could meet god and they went there often he crossed the brook kidron because there's a valley between the mountain that goes to mount zion and also where the temple is and a mountain that goes to mount of olives so he was crossing over and and then he went into the garden of gethsemane and then it says <clears throat> Uh, then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priest and the Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? So here we have an army coming to arrest Jesus torches and lanterns and weapons and and it's a great number of soldiers and temple guards and people that came with the with the religious leaders to arrest Jesus and you think you know Jesus just has a few followers that are with him and it's in the middle of the night that they they come to arrest him why bring so many soldiers but then you also have to realize that Jesus <laughs> raised the dead <laughs> and he gave sight to the blind and he healed the leper and, and he set the captives free. And he fed 5,000 with five loaves and two fish and walked on water. This army isn't big enough. <laughs> but they come to arrest Jesus. And when they get there, the first question they say is, Whom are you seeking? And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Now I want you to listen to this. This is why that army isn't big enough. It says, Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas, who betrayed him, was also stood with them. Now when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell on the ground. Then he asked them again, whom are you seeking? So this question, whom are you seeking? You know, first off, no one can stand before God. I mean, when he says, I am, what Jesus is referring to is that he is equal with God. He and the Father are one. He's talking about the fact that's, that's what's going to get him arrested and condemned is the fact that he claimed to be God. But it says here that when he said, I am he, there was so much power in that word that they couldn't even stand in the presence of Almighty God 
working through Jesus. And you remember God in the burning bush when Moses was there and 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 he asked, who is it that sent me? Who would I say sent me? He says, I am. I am that I am. God is. He always has been. Jesus had seven I am statements in the book of John. I am the true vine. I am the living water. I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. And, and you know, when he says, I am the good shepherd, all of these things, he's referring to the same thing. Before Abraham was, I am, meaning he was in the beginning with God. And so when he says this, but, but this caught my attention when I read it. Whom are you seeking? And he answered that question, I am he. When you think about it, when you want to know the meaning of life and you really want to know your purpose and why are you here, you got to come to the knowledge of God. you got to meet God. <laughs> I am he. So when it says, whom are you seeking? And he says, I am he. Realize that those answers come from a relationship with God. And then it says they fell back on the ground that, that they couldn't even stand in his presence at the word of God. Matter of fact, his weapon when he returns at the Battle of Armageddon is the Word of God. <laughs> and that's all he needs is to say the Word of God. So it says then, and they said Jesus of Nazareth a second time. Then Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way, that the saying may be fulfilled which he spoke. Of those whom you gave me, I've lost none. That was in his prayer. In verse 17, when he was talking to the Father and he says, I've lost none of those you've given me, except the son of perdition, that the scriptures may be fulfilled. So that's what he's referring to here, that protect the disciples. He is the one that's got to pay the price. Let them go free. He was paying the price so they could go free. Then Simon Peter, having drawn a sword, struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup my father has given me? So now we see Simon Peter act a valiant act. And you know, I think this goes back to the discussion at the Lord's Supper when he says, Truly you will deny before you even knew me before the cock crows. And Peter says, I will die for you. And I think he, he was trying to show Jesus he would, I mean, what what chance does he got against all these soldiers so he takes a swing at one of the one of the people and he cuts off the servant of the high priest ear of course we're told in the other passage that he Jesus healed the ear and and so the evidence would be gone as well as wanting to heal the ear and there'd be no other conflict with him serving the purpose he's done so peter he he had a valiant effort but he he did it wrong Jesus even told him, says, don't you realize that I, I have to, you know, if, if, if God, if, if I, I were here to fight, God would send 10,000 angels? But he didn't come to fight that way. You don't fight spiritual battles with swords. And so he, he tells Peter here something very powerful. He says, put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? The cup that Jesus had to drink, that the Father asked him to drink. <laughs> and he says, shall I not drink the cup? Shall I not do the Father's will? Shall I not pay the price? I want to give you a little bit of taste of what this cup is. You know, and uh, this is from Luke chapter 22. It says, and Jesus was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw. And he knelt down and prayed saying, Father, it is your, if it is your will, Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And being in agony, he prayed the more earnestly that his sweat became like giant drops of blood falling to the ground. So Jesus having to drink this cup caused him to sweat drops of blood and be in agony and turmoil because of this cup. And he asked three times, take this cup from me but not my will, but your will be done. So what is this cup? And you know, we're told so, a little more about this in the other gospels where at one time, Jesus, James and John's mother had gone to Jesus and asked that, that her son sit at his right hand and left hand in heaven. And he, Jesus says, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup 
that I have to drink? You know, when <laughs> Jesus said that, he says, you know what it takes to sit on that throne? You know what I got to do to be able to get on that throne? And he's referring to the fact of the cup. Now, he had just offered the disciples the cup of redemption, but to offer them redemption and us redemption, he had to drink a different cup. What is this cup that caused him to be in such agony and such torment that he sweat drops of blood? Because our eternity was at stake. What the Father asked him to do was pay our sin debt. What the Father asked him to do was to become sin for us and pay our debts. But can you imagine the cup full of all the dregs of the world, all the sins of the world, and, and the judgment of God, the wrath of God is in that cup to, to, to judge all of those sins, and yet he had to drink it. But for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame because of the joy set before him, because he realized that was our freedom. The only way to set us free is if he paid that price. He had to become separated from the Father and, and had to become that which is detestable to God so that we could be set free. It was the punishment he was going to go through. So he sweat drops of blood, and I think part of that reason is because he had the weight of the world on his shoulder. But if you want to know how much weight and stress was on Jesus at that time in agony, it says even an angel had to strengthen him. He was under such agony. But, but it, all of our eternities was at stake at that moment. Our, our eternal life was at stake. There's no way we'd have eternal life if he didn't go through with this. So he had to drink all of our badness, all of the things that, that we have done all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. Shall he not drink the cup? <laughs> he came to drink the cup. You know, Jesus was not captured or taken. Jesus surrendered. Then the detachment of troops and the captain and officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. And they led him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. And it was Caiaphas who advised the Jews that it was better or expedient that one man should die for the people. So they arrest him and they bound Jesus. But he had asked the others go free. But Peter and another disciple followed a distance behind to see what would happen. But here it says he went to Annas first. Annas was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest. And Annas was the previous high priest. So as a sign of respect to the former high priest, they let him try Jesus first, question Jesus first. Then they would send him across the courtyard into the Sanhedrin court to be tried by the Sanhedrin. But it's interesting because it mentions Caiaphas is the one, and this is in the story of raising Lazarus where the Jews said, and, and Caiaphas finally threw up his hand and says, now we've got to kill him be better for one man to die than the whole world perish, not realizing he actually prophesied that Jesus would die for the world. It is better that Jesus die because the whole world would perish if Jesus didn't die for us. So he actually prophesied that. Then it goes on and it says, And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did that another disciple. Now that disciple was known to the high priest and went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood at the door outside. Then the other disciple, who was known by the priest, went out and spoke to her who kept the door and brought Peter in. Then the servant girl who kept the door said to Peter, You are not, are you, you are not also one of his, this man's disciples, are you? And he said, I am not. So who was this other disciple? And most people believe that have studied the scriptures because that's, that's what John refers to himself many times, not by name. And he would have mentioned the name of this somebody else. So many believe it was John. He was, he was known by the high priest. And this lady knew he was a disciple. So she asked Peter when he came and said, you can let him in too. And he, he got into the courtyard. She asked, are you one of his disciples too? And that's the first time Peter denied him saying, I am not. See, Peter's in, in, in the wrong territory here with the wrong company here. Now we're going to, it says here, now the servants and officers who had made a fire of coals there 
for it was cold, and they warmed themselves, and Peter stood with them and warmed himself. So here we see Peter residing by this fire because it's cold outside, and he just sits there with the other people. And, you know, he, he, you ever feel like a fish out of water, like you don't belong with this crowd? I think Peter felt that way because they were all looking at him and, and would ask him questions later. But now we go back to the trial of Jesus. So we go back to Jesus. The high priest then asked Jesus about his disciples and his doctrine. This is Annas, the former high priest. Jesus answered and said, I spoke openly to the world. I always taught in synagogues and in the temple where the Jews always meet. And in secret, I have said nothing. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. Indeed, they know what I said. So Jesus basically said, I always spoke openly. In fact, Dan has probably got all the reports and knew quite well what Jesus said. But what Jesus said is very powerful. He said, I always spoke openly. I never hid my doctrine. He even went in the temple and shared in their backyard. And he's saying that he didn't keep anything secret. He, he, he made it aware to everyone. But then he says, ask those who have followed me. If you really want to know what a leader's like, ask those who follow him to see what he's like. You really want to know what Jesus is like, ask someone who follows Jesus. Uh, it, it, they know him better, and they know what he's like and what his Savior and what a Lord he is and what a Father he is. What a, what a blessing to know him. So here... You know, we have this, and he, he tells them that he, he went in. Then the high priest asked Jesus this. But then after he said this, it says, And when he had said these things, one of the officers who stood by struck Jesus with the palm of the hand, saying, Do you answer the high priest like that? Then Jesus answered, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why do you strike me? In other words, it was like they were trying to put Jesus in his place because don't you realize who you're talking to, Annas? Well, I don't think Annas knew who he was talking to. He's much higher than Annas. He is the the, the greatest high priest, the great high priest. And uh, so he had him struck. And then Jesus just asked a simple question. If I didn't speak the truth, if I spoke something off, why do you strike me? In other words, did you have a reason to strike me? But if I spoke well, you had no reason. Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. So now Anna sends him over to the Sanhedrin. And he's crossing the courtyard, and he's able to see Peter in the background warming himself by this fire in the courtyard. Now Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. Therefore they said to him, Are you also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest a relative of him whose, whose ear Peter cut off said, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter then denied again, and immediately the rooster crowed. There was a couple of events that took place here that are in the other Gospels because it referred to Jesus crossing over because what happened when Peter denied him the third time, and the third time it was somebody who actually saw him in the garden, and he was a relative of the one he's, whose ear he cut off, and so they knew him, and, and he kept denying he knew him. Well, one of the things that happened is the, the rooster crowed, and immediately Peter realized that, that Jesus said, after the rooster, before the rooster crows, you'll deny me, and he realized what he did. But there was something more powerful happened. When Jesus was crossing the courtyard, it says in the Gospel of Luke, that he looked at Peter when he denied him in, uh, the third time, and it must have crushed Peter. It says he went out and wept bitterly because he couldn't stand with Jesus, and he, he did deny him. And, and so he wept bitterly. But also look at it from, you know, the good thing Jesus prayed for him. He said, I prayed for you that you'll get through this. Satan wants to desire you, to sift you like wheat, to rub your face in it, to destroy you. He's out to steal, kill, and destroy. But, but Peter, I've prayed for you that you, when you get through this, meaning I prayed you'll get through it, <laughs> Strengthen the brethren. And you know what? He didn't do much wrong after that. <laughs> but because Jesus prayed for him and, and his life was changed. But the other thing was, look at it from Jesus' perspective. He had to see one of his closest followers deny him. 
And so here's Jesus bearing this alone. All forsook him and fled. And it says, then the rooster crowed. He went out and wept bitterly. So then they led Jesus uh, from Caiaphas to the praetorium, which is where Pilate is. And it was early morning. And they themselves did not go into the praetorium lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Pilate then went out to, to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? So here comes the Jews coming into Roman territory in the hall of the Romans, going from Jewish uh, property to Roman property. And they didn't want to enter so they wouldn't be defiled. And the reason for that is because they wanted to, to celebrate the Passover and they felt like they'd be defiled touching Gentile territory. So Pilate has to come to them, and Pilate comes to them and says, okay, what crime has he committed? And then it says, they answered and said to him, if he were not a criminal, we would not have delivered him to you. Well, now they're just saying, well, if he wasn't, didn't do something wrong, we wouldn't be giving him to you. So then Pilate said to them, then you take him, judge him according to your law. Therefore the Jews said to him, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled which he spoke, signifying by what death he would die. So now he realizes that, uh, that the reason they're bringing him to him is because they want Pilate to put him to death. They want the death penalty, and they can't do that in the Jewish law. And uh, then Pilate entered the praetorium again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? So... He goes back and he calls Jesus into Roman territory, into the Roman ground, and Jesus goes in there. So why was it okay for Jesus to go in there and not the other Jews? Because they didn't want to be defiled. You know why? Because Jesus didn't come just for the Jews. He came for the Gentiles. He doesn't care what it takes to get the Gentiles to the gospel too. Amazing. So he says, are you the king of the Jews? Because one of the, after he, they told him, that if he weren't a criminal, and he says, look, you can't, you judge him according to your law. They told him three things that, that he did. He subverts the nations. He perverts the nations with his teaching because they didn't agree with it. He fails to pay taxes to Caesar, which wasn't true because we're told in Scripture how he paid taxes. Peter was told to take a coin out of the fish's mouth and to pay their taxes. So we know he paid taxes and that he makes himself out to be a king and doesn't follow uh the, the Romans. So that's why he's asking him, are you the king of the Jews? Then Jesus answered, are you speaking for yourself about this? Or did others tell you this concerning me? The king of the Jews. And then it says, Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Your own nation and your chief priest have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight, so I, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom's not from here. You know, Pilate deals with criminals all day long, and yet he's got one here that answers questions like that. I'm not of this world. If I were of this world, my servants would fight. And, uh, and so <laughs> that goes back to him saying, We're not of this world. You know, but it's, then he says, Pilate therefore said, oh, so you are a king. So he said, yeah, I'm a king, but I'm not of this world. I'm from a different world. I'm fighting for a different kingdom. Pilate therefore said to him, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say rightly that I'm a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness of the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? Truth was on trial. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. The Bible says it's only the truth that will set you free. And if the Son sets you free, you're free indeed. Jesus is the truth. And he came to bear witness of the truth. He came to show us the truth, the reason to live. All trials, all courts, all leaders... Here's the one who's supposed to be trying to discern truth and he's asking what is truth because they're trying to find out the truth and Jesus is the truth and he's the one and he is a king <laughs> and he came to the world and that's the truth. You know, and so Pilate said to him, what is truth? And he went out again and he, he told the Jews and said to them, 
I find no fault in him at all. In other words, he's not guilty. You know, it's, the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Truth. And in chapter 17, it says, Thy word is truth. Everything around him is truth. You want to know the truth? Read the word. You want to know the truth? Come to know the Holy Spirit. You want to know the truth? Accept Jesus. He is the truth, the way and the life, to understand the meaning of life. So after this, at some point, he sends Jesus back to Herod Antipas, who was in town at that time because he found out he was from Galilee. Herod also finds no fault in him. And you always hear, no fault just man, righteous man. He's done no wrong. And he sent back to Pilate. But in the meantime, his wife came and said, have nothing to do with this just man. I've suffered much in a dream because of him. So he keeps hearing this. This is someone you don't want to deal with. So Pilate's trying to find a way to get out of this. And as we close chapter 18, in verse 39, it says, but you have a custom that I should release to you someone at the Passover. Do you therefore want me to release to you the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a robber. It says in another passage, he was a notorious criminal. He was well known as probably one of the worst criminals. And, and, and so they picked one of the worst ones they could find to bring up because it was a custom. They would pardon a prisoner as a sign of goodwill to the Jews every Passover. And so he's got this opportunity and he says, surely they'll pick Jesus. But to his dismay, the crowd called out for Barabbas and uh, to crucify Jesus. But the, it says the chief priest stirred up the crowd. But this is early morning, real early. His followers didn't really know what's going on. So, so these are people, who, if the religious leaders tell you to ask for Barabbas, they think that's the right thing to do. So they asked for the one that was the criminal to be set free and let the one who was innocent, the one who's done no wrong, <laughs> to pay the price. But you know, this is a good place for us to end today because you look at it, you have Jesus or Barabbas. One pays. Here the guilty is set free, the innocent pays. But that's a picture of us because in Romans 5, 8, it says, But God commended his love for us, or demonstrated his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Because the only reason we get set free, we are like Barabbas. You know, we're guilty. But he came into this world. This is part of building his kingdom that is not of this world. He had to pay a price that wasn't his to set us free. So Jesus pays our debt. We get to go free. God bless you. Have a blessed week. Let's pray. Thank you for paying our price. Thank you for the truth and showing us the way to live and what is the truth. Thank you for sending the Holy Spirit. Thank you for, for drinking the cup. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.